Good evening, everybody, and welcome to our webinar tonight on anger, healthy anger, and how it plays into loss. I am Alan Peterson. I'm the executive director of the Compassionate Friends, and uh, we are honored to uh, be doing this webinar tonight. Our good friends at Open to Hope, Dr. Gloria Horsley and Dr. Heidi Horsley, uh, the Compassionate Friends were the largest grief organization in the world, uh, helping families who've lost a child, grandchild, or sibling. And you can find us at thecompassionatefriends.org. And, of course, our dear friends at Open to Hope um, at opentohope.com are the world's largest resource center for television uh, programs, radio programs, webinars, and articles on grief and loss of all type. And so we're glad to bring you uh, this webinar tonight. We have a terrific a guest, uh, Dr. Bernard Golden, who is the uh, author of the book Overcoming Destructive Anger, and the subtitle, which I really like, is Strategies That Work. Anger is something that we talk about a lot in grief, but I like the idea that tonight we're talking about strategies that work. So welcome, Dr. Gloria and Dr. Heidi. And Dr. Gloria, why don't you uh, tell us a little bit uh, uh, about Bernie and a little bit of his work as we get started tonight. Dr. Bernard Golden's PhD and he's been a practicing uh, psychologist for over 40 years and a, we have been looking at his webinars. They're absolutely fantastic and a welcome to the show Bernie. We're really excited to have you on. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Okay mom, so like you said uh, this is going to be a very interesting show tonight and you know I love that we're talking about healthy anger and loss because I certainly had my share of anger when Scott died um, in a car accident and he was only 17 and that was over 30 years ago but I remember being very angry and anger is such a legitimate emotion and tonight we have a comment from somebody that's here listening and, and her name is Jamie and she's had an amazing amount of loss she's had a lot of loss she has had two miscarriages and three stillbirths in the last seven years and I am imagining that she's probably angry about it and she said that you know she's done she did everything she was supposed to do, and she doesn't know why this has happened to her. So um, I don't know if you can give some voice to that, and I know you'll be talking a lot about anger and loss, Bernie. So I'm going to turn it over to you. Yeah, let's, let's go ahead and look at first starting out with his objectives today, uh, what he's going to do, and, and move on to looking at talking about anger being a normal emotion. I'm sure we're going to answer a lot of these ladies' questions. Well, again, thank you for having me, and uh, I'd like to talk about a subject that's been a passion of mine professionally for some time now. Uh, the objectives for today include recognize anger as it's related to loss, a very natural reaction, and to learn about what I've coined over the years healthy anger. Anger is very informative. It gives us a lot of information. If we take time to pause and think about ourselves and find the meaning behind the anger, and so I also emphasize that we'll learn some key strategies for practicing healthy anger in general and uh, especially regarding loss. Anger is a, uh, a sense of threat. We feel threatened in some way to ourselves physically. We may feel threatened emotionally. Uh, we may feel threatened in terms of resources, our time, our, our, our money, uh, and certainly those we love. But anger is also about inner pain. Anger is always a reaction to and is sometimes a distraction from inner pain. So other negative feelings such as loss lead us to experience anger, anxiety, shame, frustration, a whole variety of negative feelings coupled with some kind of threat. And again, that's feeling threatened, so it could be real or just perceived. I looked around for a slide that I thought could depict grief, and clearly everyone experiences grief in different ways and, and with some varying intensities. And I found this one, which I thought is the uh, is a more extreme experience of feeling isolated, trying to close off the world, trying to close off uh, all the stop time, but also because of feeling isolated, maybe not available to get the kind of comforting that, that we need when we're going through grief. It's a picture that shows also that besides isolation, the sense of darkness, closing down, shutting down. And uh, I just wanted to emphasize that it's understandable experiencing grief at this level that we would experience some form of anger. 
Anger is a natural part of loss. It may be directed toward the world, toward life, especially when we have an expectation that life should be fair when in fact it isn't. Mm. They have anger toward caretakers, medical field, others who are involved in caring for someone. Very much we may have a reaction of anger toward ourselves. The coulda, woulda, should is of life. I could have uh, taken this action, or I shouldn't have taken that action. It's so easy to beat ourselves over the head with hindsight about insights perhaps that we didn't have at the time. We could be angry with loved ones for actions again that they took or didn't take. It's very natural to have that experience. The person who who's lost you're dealing with. One's God. And angry feelings could also be a reaction to suffering. I'm angry that I'm suffering. I'm angry that I'm grief. And that often comes about from judging our feelings rather than accepting that they're a natural part of, of being human. You know, Bernie, I really like these and a lot of them resonate with me and, and people that I know that have had losses. I mean, I think it's interesting because sometimes anger is not rational. And I remember when my brother died, I was angry at him for abandoning me, even though, you know, he died in a car accident, but I felt abandoned. And I, I've heard so often, my mom and I have done so many shows where people were angry at God. And we always say, you know, that's okay. God has big shoulders. God can handle it. Um, I think those are just, I like this list because I think it, it's really a normal thing to be angry at all of this, everything that you said here. I think it's validating, too. Because a lot of people can have more than one of these, several of these, mm -hmm. and, yes. and yet I know I've met a lot of people who they were angry at the, at the person who died, but then guilty that they felt angry, you know, mm -hmm. but it was all real, and I think it's just validating to let people know that anger is natural and that, you know, most of us in this type of a grief experience it. Well, feeling stem from the rational, from the emotional brain, and sometimes it may not make sense rationally, but it's very uh, part of being human that we have those range of feelings. Factors that may impact the level of anger or the quality of anger include the nature of the relationship you had with the person, mm -hmm. especially if it's an ambivalent relationship. It might provoke a lot of guilt or feeling uh, pulled in different directions. Your relationship you know, that's, that's a good point, Bernie, because sometimes I think people are surprised um, sometimes when like somebody dies and they're angry because they died or whatever or I, I see a lot of times where there are people who haven't resolved relationships with their parents and they're angry because they thought they would at some time and it never happened. Right, the, the, the closing off of that opportunity leads to anger as well as it's easy sometimes to think of a person or a parent or, in one way. Either you may have positive feelings or negative, but the more complicated a relationship is, it's harder to sit with having that kind of uh, variety of feelings. Well, well, I think when you're thinking about sibling loss also, a lot of times we have complicated relationships with our brothers and sisters. It's not because we don't love them, but it's normal to, to fight with siblings as you're growing up, and so it gets very complicated when they die because sometimes we have a lot of unresolved business. Definitely. I think our relationships with siblings is sometimes underrated in terms of modern psychology, ignoring mm -hmm. the very powerful impact relationships with siblings can have. So permission to grieve, even giving yourself permission is a tough thing, huh? Very much so. We can be more readily compassionate with other people, but to give ourselves permission to grieve comes from our openness to being compassionate with ourselves that we deserve and it's okay to do that. And any past learning we've ever had about being compassionate or dealing with uh, anger, those will inhibit our ability to grieve. Now these are feelings that can accompany anger of loss. I know all of you may be familiar with uh, the stages of loss and I think the more you look at it as a variety of feelings rather than trying to identify specific stages, you're getting a more accurate uh, connection with what you're feeling at any given time. And these are the variety of feelings you might feel that go through and sometimes they vary from time to time. Right. A lot of feelings. And I've got somebody here who says that she, uh, or it could be he, I'm not sure, said that their uh, main feeling is uh, anger bordering on rage 
and I'm exercising, and uh, what are some constructive ways to deal with that? Bernie's got some really great ideas on how you can deal with it. Some people are very comfortable with anger for a variety of reasons. They've grown up, and they can feel okay about experiencing that, and some are so uncomfortable. They feel that they're bad or, or they have been afraid from childhood to be angry. And so sometimes the signs of anger get evidence in these kinds of uh, behaviors, increase their irritability. Or the word I like is brittle. People are sometimes more brittle. Uh, yeah. Anxiety might be more anxious than angry. Physical Alan, do you identify with any of this? Well, what I'm fascinated by was, and we don't have to go back a couple of slides, but where you talked about our relationship with anger. And I think something that I learned in, in reviewing and preparing for this earlier that I hope you touch on is that for some of us, we have to come to terms with anger itself before we can work through anger. Because in my loss, I had an, an anger at a level I'd never experienced it in my life, ever. And then, but it took a while for me to work through and figure out that my own relationship with anger had to be kind of dealt with so I could figure out how to process this anger. And that's why I love so much about this information. And I think these signs of anger related to loss, we don't always equate that these, you know, we think of ourselves in grief, but that these can be signs that we have this anger that maybe we haven't figured out how to process. Also, Alan, I think sometimes people feel more comfortable in the anger and it's more it's scarier to be to look at what's underneath the anger like the feelings of hopelessness or right. worthlessness or depression because that kind of feels powerless and yeah. sometimes like Bernie was saying some people are comfortable with the anger so like like you said it's, it gets complicated because what else is going on and what's underneath and sometimes anger is coupled with so many other feelings exactly and when we're angry, we're focusing our attention outward on the person or the situation that has triggered our anger. And when we're experiencing those other feelings, that's much more uncomfortable to sit with the emotional and physical tension that goes with them. You know, the, the impact I'm looking at here that I think uh, really for people who've had a loss, I think that um, that depression and excessive shame and guilt is really heavy duty. You know, I had my daughter, I'll give you my example, and maybe some people listening can relate to it tonight. My daughter wasn't wearing a seatbelt uh, when Ashley died in a car accident on, on the interstate. I'd taken her car away a couple of times because she showed up in front of the house and I saw she didn't have a seatbelt on. But I was angry at her, and I, but, but then I was guilty, and I felt shame for having anger. I was anger at, angry at the neighbor's because their dog barked during the day and that's the only time I could sleep when Ashley first died and I'm wonderful people but I was literally filled with hatred toward these people but I couldn't understand where it was all coming from I think mm -hmm. that's uh, that's important so I learned a lot about myself learning about anger taught me a lot about myself in general um, that has helped me so uh, that's why I love so much of this tonight to talk Mm -hmm. I, I was angry with the kid driving the car, even though he was Scott's right. cousin. Scott was sitting in the car, and you know, somebody else was driving when he got killed. Healthy anger involves a variety of practices and, and and abilities because anger is a habit. It's a habit in thinking and feeling, and so learning to observe and experience anger without being reactive to it involves learning how to pause, to reflect. Mm -hmm. Using anger as a signal to turn direction inward, become aware of it, our expectations. It involves developing compassionate skills, and I'll talk about that in a minute, that increasingly research emphasizes being compassionate with ourselves, even having compassionate thoughts, actually changes our physiology to help us feel more relaxed and calm our body, which is a big part of healthy anger. And then developing strategies to let go of it involving forgiveness, for example, of ourselves. Bernie, and could, Bernie could you expand on, on the number three, real, identifying unrealistic expectations that make you vulnerable to anger? What do you mean by that? Sure. The expectations, I say, we wake up every morning with expectations, a blueprint in our mind about how life should be, how people should behave, how the world should treat us. And we have this blueprint 
And sometimes things change and don't meet or satisfy the expectations we have. And resilience is recognizing that maybe we have no control. So we have to gradually let go of expectations rather than hold on to them rigidly. The other aspect of expectations where they can be unrealistic is where they're really more based on hopes, wishes. A simple example of, of a man who is angry at his wife for being late 40 minutes for every activity. When I asked him how long has that been going on, he said, we're married 15 years. Oh. And what I mean is he's holding on emotionally to an expectation rather than thinking more rationally. And so right. unreasonable, unrealistic expectations make us more prone to anger. Mm -hmm. right. and, and Bernie, I love that you talk about developing self-compassion because I feel like we're often more compassionate with others and very critical and hard on ourselves. And it's so important to be compassionate with ourselves and not to be too judgmental and punitive and critical with ourselves. And that's a challenge for many people. Uh, mm -hmm. Part of healthy anger, I, I borrow from three different areas, self-awareness, becoming more connected with your body, what, are, what, are my, what are the sensations in my body. The more you practice that, the more you're prepared in a moment of anger to calm your body, the more you rehearse your thoughts and emotions to be able to label feelings. When we label feelings, that helps us actually decrease the intensity of anger when we actually give a label. Mindfulness and mindfulness meditation are ways of ex observing our experience rather than reacting to our thoughts sensations or our feelings. And as you say, being compassionate for others, many people find much easier mm -hmm. than being compassionate for with ourselves. We find, or we may experience it as being self-absorbed or feeling selfish. I don't deserve is often a statement that we play over and over again in our mind that keeps us from being self-compassionate. You know, I think we're going to find uh, with a lot of people listening to this show that they are going to like your anger a lot because I frankly think that if you're in the midst of a loss, sometimes you can't stop to meditate or think or take time or just identifying the emotions can be really important. I find that most people will increase their skills and self-awareness and you're right. Mindfulness meditation is nothing to uh, suddenly start using if that's not been a, a, an ongoing part of your life when you're dealing at the very moment of loss. The framework I've developed over time, I ask clients, people I work with, say, recall an event which you became angry. It might be the loss. It might be another situation. And play it over in your mind to some degree, picturing the details, and summarize it as a triggering event and the level, give a rating of the level of anger that you experience. Mm, but, like this, but this is a, a special video. You could not only look at the details, you could forward it slowly, rewind it slowly, but it's a video into your own experience, what's going on inside you. And so I have clients back up from the moment they're experiencing anger to recognize what are the negative feelings that they're experiencing to help push them into anger. And this isn't easy. Being able to label our feelings has nothing to do with intelligence or our chronological age. It has to do with the experience that we've grown up with of being able to tease out our feelings. And so I encourage uh, clients, I include this in my book, a feelings list. If you remember from school, it was easier to do multiple choice than a feeling in the same way. It sometimes is easier to identify feelings by looking at this list. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's right, just looking at it. You know, a lot of people that we work with talk about um, journaling and how it helps them. And, you know, uh, putting down your feelings and recognizing them is pretty powerful. And this is a log that helps identify the feelings and identify what I call the chronology of your anger arousal. Uh, it's based on the, the actual framework that includes all these parts of it. And so working backwards, I help clients identify the anger, the, the intensity of anger, negative feelings. And then there's also a thought, a knee-jerk thought. The thought might be uh, the conclusion you made about the triggering event the implication, what it, the meaning of the triggering event, and what you're telling yourself will increase or 
decrease the degree or intensity of negative feelings, things like this shouldn't be happening to me, life should be fair, like the, or, or the conclusion might be life isn't fair. This is happening again. And one thing I'll emphasize is that once we're saying this is happening again to any incident about anger, we are revisiting other experiences of anger. So overly I mean, intense that's a good point. And so overly intense anger may no longer be just about the current event. It may not be just about the current loss as well. And so backing up, I help people look at expectations and then desires. Anger is all about some desire being thwarted or challenged. So desire for safety, desire for connection, desire for stability in my life. Uh, these are all desires that are triggered when we deal with loss. These are desires that are threatened. On the bottom of, the, of this log, it says self-talk coinciding with the negative feelings, including anger. And that's the kind of self-talk that might go on, the internal dialogue while you're angry and feeling those feelings. But even the idea of uh, someone should be punished, the key desire might be justice. Mm -hmm. I really like the idea of, of when we say this is happening again, that we are revisiting a past event. And so our anger is really going to grow if we, continue, if we do that. Especially if we haven't really made some peace with those past events. Uh, the emotional brain, as I said earlier, it does no time. So it collapses all the experiences you've had, especially if you haven't made peace with some other, whether it's losses or other triggering events regarding anger, then this one will be more intense. I, I love that. You don't know time. That's right. It, uh, things come back. And we've got a question here. Somebody says, I'm watching what you're saying. I'm wondering, have you found any difference between male and female anger? Uh, I see... In my practice, mostly male men come in for, for the anger management, sometimes referred by spouse or girlfriend, mother. Uh, I see some women typically, and this is changing over time, but typically women will stay more with those other feelings before anger that trigger the anger, whereas men uh, act out the anger and are more in touch with the anger. You know, do you remember that work of John Gottman? I'm sure you do where he said that it takes men 20 minutes to calm down, where women calm down much faster? Definitely. Uh, I saw a couple of years ago where they had had an argument, and half an hour later he was saying, well, what should we have for dinner? And she said, mm. dinner? Dinner? Are you kidding? <laughs> she needed three hours <laughs> to his half hour. So there are differences. Right. Okay. So here are some ideas for expanding your self-awareness. I like these. These are, these are great practical things. All right, there are activities you can engage in daily. Do a check-in. Asking yourself just a couple of minutes, what am I feeling right now? What was I feeling a couple of minutes ago? What are my thoughts? Where is my mind taking me? Engaging in body scans from head to toe, just taking a minute or two to sense what you're experiencing throughout your body so you become more keenly aware of your body. And again, that's practice for when you're angry Identify those feelings that trigger your anger. Be mindful to the thoughts, including those expectations or the appraisals you make. And engage in muscle relaxation exercises. This is rehearsal. Uh, you can see these. I, I have some on my website or the internet in general. Scanning your body and relaxing the muscles so you really know what it feels like to feel relaxed. Your body develops body memory. And so rehearsing but the time when you're actually angry or you're being around other people who are angry, you can then evoke physical calmness through that rehearsal. I'm thinking I wish I would have had all this information like 15 years ago. It would have been, uh, been terrific uh, because I think understanding what to do and being aware of what's going on with you when you get angry because it's a very serious and, and, and can be very destructive. And, and we've all seen that in people's lives where anger has, has caused great damage. So uh, I just, yeah, I wish well, I would have had this good information, and I'm glad we're providing it for people now. 
Well, yeah. and I like the word that we're talking. We're not just talking about the thoughts, but we're look. We're talking about how is where is it? Where is the anger in your body, and where are you feeling it? You know, and how is it manifesting? And I think some of us we get out of touch with that piece of it. That's a key part of recognizing anger. I was speaking to a friend this weekend, and I, I mentioned the work I do, and he said, oh, I never thought of anger being related to your body. All our feelings oh. come, come from our body, and when we listen, and I say they percolate, then we might recognize the feeling. So it, uh, it very much is a mind-body state of being, in a sense. Mm -hmm. I've got a, a, a comment here, and I think this might be a good place for it. I don't know if you have the right answer for this. It's more of a statement, but it's from Brad, who says that uh, since his loss, which has been about three years ago, that he literally wakes up every morning angry, and he, he goes jogging, and sometimes that helps. But every single morning he wakes up, and that's like one of the first emotions it's, that he feels. And is that normal, natural? Is it something that will go away? He's found his own way, I guess, of dealing with it. But are there people like that? Is that is that natural? The way we deal with anger is different from person to person. There comes a point when the anger is, is ongoing for a long time and it's interfering with a person's life. And it may be a time to look more closely at when we uh, obsess with anger or obsess about anything, many times our obsessions are, are distractions from some of the anxiety about moving on. I, I sometimes think that uh, holding on to anger may serve a purpose. Mm-hmm. Ah. That's interesting. I, I, I've never thought about it that way, Bernie. So it's a, it's a distraction from some of the anxiety. Definitely. In, in that way, I see all anger as coming from an attempt at our own self-compassion. We're feeling inner pain, and if I'm with anger, momentarily I might distract myself from that pain. So it's, it's uh, I call that compassion going awry rather than really genuinely being self-compassionate and dealing with the feelings and the desires behind it. So if you're saying it, it, it can be like a coping mechanism in, Very much for so. some people? Very wow. much so. It, it meant, it's meant to protect us from other vulnerability, sensitivity to other pain. In the past 10 years, uh, there have been, there's been great research regarding compassion, the brain, how being compassionate changes our physical, physiological reactions. And so we all have different selves. You might be a husband, a parent, a mother, a teacher, a lawyer, we, a friend. So we have different selves. and Lying dormant, maybe not so dormant for some, much, uh, much more overt for others, is a compassionate self, our capacity to be compassionate. And so developing your compassionate self with an exercise that uh, I, I have on one of the slides, to be able to sit with and soothe difficult emotions. You call on this, I used to say that your parental nurturing part Part that uh, can sit with emotion. Practice visualization involving your compassionate self. So one exercise I invite people to do is pretend you're in a school play and identify being a compassionate parent to a child who's ill or sick. And some people will say, well, I have no children. And yet very quickly they're able to evoke their compassionate self. Practice visualizing giving compassion to someone else. And then this is the hard one, practicing it with yourself. So when you evoke your compassion itself and practice that routinely, and if you go ahead to the next slide, once you're able to develop that compassion itself, you could speak to yourself in the sense of quiet thoughts. So you evoke your compassion itself. You may sit place your hand over the area of your body where you're feeling pain, whether it's anger, hurt, loss, and direct these By thoughts. The way, let's let's uh, uh, challenge everybody to do that right now. Can you put your hands wherever it is that you're suffering right now, whoever's listening? Okay. And direct these thoughts toward it. And let me say ahead of time, if this is uncomfortable, do not do it. Some people find this very uncomfortable, so I want to say that ahead of time. Uh, 
Okay. And I'll explain afterwards. This is a moment of suffering. This hurts. I'm not alone. We all struggle. May I accept myself as I am. May I be patient. These phrases are not intended to avoid, deny, minimize the hurt. They're actually meant to help us sit with it. At this moment, we're engaged as an observer. When you evoke your compassion itself, and then you're also the person who is experiencing the pain. And that wow. helps. I can really, how is that for everyone? I can really feel it. This, this, well, to me, this is so incredibly powerful. This slide, this is what I wish everybody um, who's, who suffers with anger had hanging somewhere where they could read it every day. I mean, the power in those words to acknowledge for yourself, this is a moment of suffering. This hurts. I'm not alone. We all struggle. May I accept myself as I am, and may I be patient. And that is, I mean, it's, it, it evokes emotion in me just hearing that, because that is a gift to ourselves, and that. So it's just very powerful. Just very it's, powerful. I agree with you, Alan, and I love the idea of placing your hand wherever you okay, have well, the, those feelings. So and I, I do a workshop and, and, and I spend a lot of time around guilt and regret. And, um, and, you know, one of the things at our conference, Bernie, at our national conference is, you know, the person who uh, draws the shortest straw has to do the workshop on anger because it's difficult because when you're doing that workshop or that sharing session, there is such incredible anger because people are hurting. And to be able to give them something like this that's real and valid, it's just very healing. And um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm quite touched by, by this slide. Now, Bernie, what did you say some of the issues could be with that? Yeah, but if you have had a past where perhaps growing up you didn't get enough compassion, you may have turned off the desire for it. You may experience compassion as weak, as a weakness. So you may remind yourself, oh, there are so few moments I had of compassion, and I, I, I'm overwhelmingly sad about that, filled with grief about that. And so just doing this exercise may be very uncomfortable, in which case uh -huh. it involves some work with a counselor, perhaps, or talking with friends to really deal with some of those earlier wounds to be able to evoke that kind of compassion. Love it. So talk about this practicing bear for healthy anger. This is a, an acronym that I developed actually after the book. For, for several years I tried to figure out a, uh, an acronym. But BEAR involves breathing deeply, inhaling and exhaling, and really emphasize the exhale. I say one-third inhale, two-thirds exhale. Some studies say that that kind of a pace creates an even greater level of relaxation in the, in the body. Mm -hmm. E stands for calming your body, but again, this is based on the practice of physical relaxation exercises. If you don't practice the exercises, you're really trying to just direct your body with your, with your intellect, your rational brain, rather than being able to recall and feel the difference as your body uh, begins to become calm and relaxed. A is arouse compassion for yourself and others, again, coming based on those exercises is that when you're angry, turn your attention inward again. For what is the pain behind my anger? And if I'm involved with an argument with someone else, if they're angry, what kind of pain are they experiencing? Because I now know there are other negative feelings, and maybe they're feeling threatened. They may not feel safe. So arousing compassion for others involves developing your own empathy for them as well as yourself. Mm -hmm and are involved reflecting on thoughts and feelings. Am I being realistic? What knee-jerk appraisal, what knee-jerk conclusion did I make? And could I entertain one that is less threatening? And maybe another alternative possibility without jumping the gun. We all have hot buttons. We all have vulnerable sensitivities which make us have quick knee-jerk thoughts about various triggering events. And so uh, reminding yourself to practice bear at these moments of intensity. One thing that I 
I've heard a number of you say earlier was that posting these someplace could be helpful. I'm extremely uh, encouraging of anyone to give view, visual cues. We all need visual cues. And uh, a client of mine just put the word as a password, stay calm, in, in his cell phone. I like his specific practices. I the seek connection with others. I think that's so important. I love the fact that we're connecting with people right now and they're listening to us and we're doing some things together and you know we're uh, all with you and, and connected together and looking at this anger thing. Especially when we're feeling alone, whether we're dealing with loss or anger, we feel more isolated. And feeling connection reminds us again that we are uh, that we are, are together. Uh, we may not always be in the mood to be with others, especially if you're feeling like you have to worry about what they're feeling or you have to entertain them or their needs, but especially dealing with loss, we need the, uh, the comfort and support that others can provide. Mm -hmm. Setting limits and boundaries. Saying no is a very powerful anger management strategy. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I'm not up to coming, I'm not up to bringing food or whatever, I need some time alone. Whatever it is, being able to say no and set limits is a very uh, practical strategy. Yeah, and you know, I mean, if you don't please yourself, you're angry at yourself, and if and if other people are going to be angry at you anyway, I always say that about um, when you don't want to go to an event, like you want to change. A lot of times, very people want to do something different during a holiday or whatever. And I always say, tell them early. They're not going to like it, but uh, tell them early, and you know, and you will, you know, you need to please yourself and respect your own boundaries. I was just thinking about we do a lot of holiday webinars, and that's one of the top points we talk about is to learn your limits and and what you can and can't do uh, on certain situations. So as, as I see a lot of this, um, it's great for anger, but it's it's great just for processing grief in general. So many of these points are, and that's certainly one of them. Mm -hmm. The next one I, I share is observing rather than thinking. So let's say you're walking down the street and you're suddenly experiencing grief or anger or a variety of reactions like that. I suggest you ask yourself, is there anything specific I want to do about this, whether it's anger or grief? And if there is, make an appointment with yourself to spend 15 minutes or half an hour that evening. And if you identify that actually there's nothing more I can do, look at your watch and ask yourself, how much time do I want to feel this pain in my body for the next few minutes? How much time do I want to feel this tension, this hurt? And if you are saying, well, I, I need to move on. Observe rather than think. Observe your feet on the ground. Observe the air on your hands and face. Notice the people around you. Listen to the sounds. Notice the textures of things around you, the color. When we observe, we can momentarily get out of our head from thinking or analyzing. And that kind of ability to do that can be very uh, soothing. Mm, yeah. I like that. I have kind of a little thing that I do sometimes when I'm really upset. I think about a big trunk and I open it up, it's bottomless, and I throw all the crap in it. And when I do that, a special key appears that I can open to go into my own peaceful place. But the key won't appear unless I get rid of the junk. I like that strategy. <laughs> <laughs> so that's my peaceful place. <laughs> uh -huh. No, what about real concentrated money. grieving? I was thinking of it, our friend Eric Hipple, who was quarterback for the Detroit Lions. His son died by suicide, and he used to uh, go to work, and he told us, and then at night he had a special time when he'd go down into his basement, his man cave, and light a candle and think about his son. Mm -hmm. Really setting aside time to honor one's grief. And rather than be distracted throughout the day or, or, or mind, the mind taking us there, Setting aside a time to look at pictures, to, to light a candle, to look at videos, to write a poem, to look at writing. Uh, writing is so powerful for us because what it does is help put our thoughts in order. It helps us get more connected with ourselves. But, so that could be concentrated grieving. Power of music. Some people are responders and others aren't. And I was thinking of uh, bringing a musical piece to this webinar and they thought, well, everyone has their different tastes. 
Sometimes you may need powerful music that uh, resonates with your anger. Sometimes you may need soothing music. Sometimes you may need a combination of both. So music can be very powerful. Well, I think there's just, I agree with, um, with Bernie, even on the writing. I think when you make that heart, um, hand, and mind connection where they're all at work and you're able to just let words flow or to be able to absorb music, I think it is healing because it takes you to um, kind of a different place, that peaceful place. And also this concentrated grieving. What I've learned with people who do that is it helps them have a little less anxiety that they know that at, at the end of the day they're going to sit out in their garden or they're going to do whatever, that they know they're going to get their time and their space to grieve. They've already given themselves permission. And most people that do that, I find, don't have as much anxiety that, you know, yes, they still may have a rush of grief or anger during the day that's triggered by something, but it helps them manage that greatly because they know, nope, 6 o'clock tonight, I'll be out in the garden, you know, out in the garage or wherever it is that I'm going to be, and that's going to be my grieving time with my music or whatever. I have unresolved feelings with loved ones and especially with the lodge. I say write a letter and include, start out with what is it you'd like this person to know that perhaps you haven't shared or you want to just repeat it again. And then as part of your own letter, write down what is it you'd like to hear back. It really is a way of focusing on what are our needs, what is it that we'd like to hear, and uh, a way of uh, recognizing ourselves in a more clear, accurate way. Bernie, I love this because oftentimes when we're angry, we don't feel like we're getting what we need from other people. And sometimes we need just to be validated and acknowledged and for people to say, you have every right to be angry right now. And I love the idea of writing a letter to ourselves so that we can give ourselves what we really need. It's mm -hmm. Writing a letter from your compassionate self to your self-suffering self. Right. It really helps separate I like that. that out. Yeah, because you, uh, you know, you always have people say, well, write a letter to the person you're angry with. I guess that would be it. But write a letter, uh, you know, to someone else. I, I, yeah, I love this. You know, I worked with 9-11 families for 10 years. They lost a firefighter in the Trade Center. And most of them were very, very angry because their loved ones were murdered by terrorists. And this was something we talked about often. And, and one of the things that a lot of the, my clients said was that people were constantly trying to shut down their anger and tell them that they shouldn't be angry anymore. And they were like, it's not that easy. We want to, you know, we don't know how to move forward with that. What do you mean by being mindful to bleeding anger? I was trying to figure that out earlier, and I could not. Okay. When you're angry, let's say at home, be mindful to it bleeding into work. Or if you're angry about things going on at work, right. be mindful of it bleeding into home or, or on the road. So you're aware of uh, the more you can target your anger in your own mind so it doesn't spill over into other activities of your life. Mm. Oh. Uh, I like that because I think there is a lot of, uh, as you say, bleeding anger that we don't mm -hmm. stop. My but website is angermanagementeducation.com. Okay, fantastic. Awesome. So, so I've got a couple of questions here that uh, uh, pe the people have watched. It. A woman, Rachel, says, um, <laughs> she says, how do I get my husband into therapy? He's so angry. His face goes red all the time. He still wants to know how to get him into therapy. I get a lot of calls from people who are wanting their significant other in therapy <laughs> and very often about anger. And most you can do is share how you're impacted by the anger. When you do that, I feel, I feel threatened. I feel anxious. I'm wanting to help you. I'm wanting to... What I say is anger is about pain, and so I wanted to help you with your pain, but also to help you move on to our more fulfilling life, because when we deal effectively with anger, we really do make room for more joy in our life. Mm -hmm. So yeah. giving her personal reaction, how she's impacted by it. Right, I love that. You know, and I think sometimes, uh, I think... Uh, men are impacted when uh, a wife says that hurts me or that makes me sad you know when you're uh, when you behave like that or whatever just being honest but another person says um, could you talk a little bit more about an unfair world and because uh, I'm feeling like there should be some justice right uh, 
one of the complications about expectations is that we have that emotional mind and the rational mind. And we want and wish for fairness, predictability. We want justice. And yet in the real world, there, many times it doesn't happen. And there is no recourse. Sometimes there is. Sometimes our recourse, we think that will help with the pain. For example, they, they've done studies of uh, someone losing someone to, to a murder. And they find the person and they, they watch an execution in the most extreme case. And they say, I have closure. A year later, they don't have, they don't have closure. So in so many ways, there, there isn't justice. But we want it and we feel we, we should get it, but it's not there. And that, that's sometimes that discrepancy. The ability to let go of that expectation and move on is very difficult to, to bridge. Okay, I, I included this quote, especially as it emphasizes that healing comes from letting there be room for all this to happen, that we should accept all our feelings. And that's how we actually move past them, creating room for grief, for relief, for misery. And that allows us to experience joy once again. And this um, is like Eva Sheldon, who was a uh, Buddhist monk. Having compassion yeah. still starts and ends with having compassion for all those unwanted parts of ourselves. The healing comes from letting there be room for all of this to happen. Room for grief, for relief, for misery, and for joy. I just love this whole idea of compassion and having self-compassion and really loving on ourselves because, you know, everyone on this webinar has had a significant loss and you have a legitimate right to your anger. However, we need to find productive and healthy ways to release our anger or it will destroy our lives. So I want to thank Bernie for this message and Love this quote. It's wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Bernie. You're welcome. Again, thank you for the opportunity to share this. Yeah, uh, Bernie, I, I can't thank you enough on behalf of uh, the compassionate friends and for all those uh, in our organization uh, who are going to benefit from having this available on YouTube to watch uh, and to learn from and, and on behalf of Open to Hope. So thank you so much for taking the time and being here. Once again, your book is. Uh, uh, overcoming destructive anger strategies that work. Dr. Gloria, Dr. Heidi, again, great information. It was a wonderful webinar. We want to thank uh, Heather Horsley, who keeps all the trains running on time and gets us where we need to be and is our producer. Uh, thank you all for listening in again tonight. Uh, and on behalf of Open to Hope and the Compassionate Friends, we thank you for joining us. Good night. Thanks, Alan. Bye.